Okay. So I'm, I'm waiting to see our filmmaker <laughs> in the list of participants. If you're there, Sharam, and I'm not seeing you right away, uh, speak up and... I did ask if he was going to be available to uh, start us off or if he'd wait till afterward. And he said, no, he would start us off, but it is early for him. So um, just give it a, a few more for everybody to join us. We had, uh, yeah, about 80 people register. So there's 24 of us on right now, so. Just want to be sure people have uh, found it. Is everybody excited to see oh, Adam and that. Jupiter tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys been tracking it? For the lucky folks in the desert. Yeah. Yeah. I know. So, well, that's why we're doing this today to celebrate the uh, winter solstice instead of tomorrow, too, because those of us who are astronomy buffs are going to be outside <laughs> hoping to hoping to see it and catch a glimpse in the telescope. Um, if you do have a telescope, you'll see both planets and their bright moons all in one field of view. Wow. Is pretty extraordinary. So yeah, we've got solstice, we've got conjunction, we have uh, Ursid meteor showers, lots, lots happening. And light pollution and clouds. <laughs> we always have those though. Yeah, well, you know, look at all the things that we would be seeing without light pollution and clouds, er ergo us being here. I can watch it another time. We can do something about one of those for sure. <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna ask, um, for anybody, if you're, um, when you're not speaking and um, to just kind of turn off the microphones, um, especially during the presentation. Um, yeah. And if you have kind of shaky Wi-Fi, you no. might turn off your video too. The more people who turn off their video, there'll be less shaky Wi-Fi for, for yeah. others with low bandwidth. Yeah, okay, well, I'm not seeing the numbers go up, so I'm going to 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 get started and, and welcome everybody. So I don't know where you found out about us, but uh, this is this uh, this screening is being hosted by the Basin and Range Dark Sky Cooperative. And it's the movie Saving the Dark, a documentary by filmmaker Sriram Morali. Um, and we'll, we'll be meeting him during this time. And uh, I've told a few other people, but I saw folks registered from seven countries and several states, including all the states of the Basin and Range Geographic Pro uh, Province, which includes parts of California and Oregon, Idaho, Nevada. Um, well, actually parts of New Mexico, the Basin and Range is a pretty large area and it's pretty well known because of its high altitude and clear skies. So it's a great place for, for, for dark skies. Um, my name's Dawn Nielsen and I'm the Dark Sky Preservation Director for Rose City Astronomers, a very large astronomy club in the Portland metro area, but our reach extends uh, throughout Oregon. I'm also an IDA delegate an active member of the Basin and Range uh, Cooperative, the Oregon Outback Dark Sky Network, and the Western Night Sky Council. And I do this all as a volunteer, um, as a passionate amateur astronomer and an ecologist. And again, for logistics, if you could mute your microphones if you're not going to be speaking. Um, and after a small introduction by Ashley Pipkin, who is with the National Park Service and who put together this uh, Dark Sky Cooperative. Um, we'll have a small intro, hopefully, by our, our filmmaker as soon as he joins. And then we'll be showing the film. And I have the film on my computer as an MP4, and I'm showing it through an Ethernet cable so that we have the best stability. But in case you're not getting a very good um, picture from that, 
I'm right now going to paste, here we go, in the chat, a link because this is now available over YouTube. And uh, you can kind of close out the Zoom, watch it on YouTube, and come back and join us at 7.15 for the Q&A. Um, just come back onto the Zoom if that's going to help your bandwidth. But I'm hoping that with given our numbers and given how we've got it set up that we're going to be fine. Um, also, uh, you can see there's a chat. So if you have questions, particularly questions of the filmmaker or questions of uh, Ashley or I about dark skies and dark sky preservation, what you might do or where to go to see dark skies, um, please put those in the chat or um, okay, so I just want to give you a little background on, on Ashram. He's uh, joining us all the way from India, which is 13 and a half hours ahead of us. And uh, he's somebody who's very passionate about astronomy and the night skies. And so he took it upon himself to raise awareness on light pollution through filmmaking. And this has been a labor of love for him. Um, he's best known for his viral videos, Lost in Light 1 and Lost in Light 2, and both of those are on YouTube. They're two to three minutes long, and they're great videos to share with friends if you're interested in some, doing some advocacy. And also this feature documentary of Saving the Dark, which has been viewed, um, it's only recently been put on YouTube, and it's already had over 12,000 uh, 12, hits. So after this, I encourage you all to share it with friends. And while filmmaking and dark sky advocacy are hobbies of Sharam, full time, he gets paid because this is all voluntary uh, as an analyst fighting abuse of various Google products. So he's a he's an IT person. But you would never know that filmmaking is a hobby when you see how beautifully done this film is. And just for some background, I wanted to say that uh, I first saw this film uh, with an invitation to an eco film festival, an invitation to be a panelist uh, post screening of this movie at an eco film festival in Portland and met with the filmmaker beforehand and then watched the movie at the same time that everybody else did. And I was struck and blown away. I felt it to be so comprehensive and to be done in such an aesthetically beautiful way that I thought if everybody could see this brief one hour film that we could make a difference. And so I made a promise to myself that I would try to do as many screenings of this as I could and, and uh, kept that promise pre-COVID and now we're doing it online to all be together in this discussion. So um, I wanna encourage you to come up with the same. I was asked if this is a, uh, an international thing. It can be, people from all over the world can do these kinds of screenings and get the word out. So now I wanna just turn it over to Ashley, again with the Park Service, who will tell us a little bit about what this Basin Arranged Dark Sky Cooperative is all about. Can you see my screen? We can. Okay, great. I just started, I'll start off with the, um, the flyer and just if there are a few more people that join. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Like Dawn said, my name is Ashley Pipkin. I work for the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division of the National Park Service. And I also have the great pleasure of coordinating the Basin and Range Dark Sky Cooperative. I'm really proud of the work we do in the cooperative and of this very special screening of Saving the Dark. Um, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A with Sri Ram Urali. All right, let's see. So while I currently coordinate the Basin and Range Dark Sky Cooperative who's bringing us this opportunity tonight, I just wanted to say that the cooperative is a group of people who all work together and without each other and without your support and you joining us today, um, we couldn't accomplish all that we do. So we are composed of a wonderful group of federal, state, and we have nonprofit partners as well. And we all work together to celebrate and interpret the night sky and this multi-state effort. Um, our resources put together are our best hope for protecting and accessing our beautiful night skies. 
So before we start the film, I just wanted to share that the Basin and Range Dark Sky Cooperative encompasses the largest contiguous natural night sky left in the lower 48. Uh, let's get my laser pointer. It's in this area you can see. Um, this area features really exceptional night sky quality. Places where the night sky stretches all the way from one horizon to the next. Um, there are clear views uh, and the beauty of the cosmos is on full display. Um, and it's surrounded by mountain peaks and dry lake beds. Uh, tonight, we're gonna share this amazing film with you and we'll learn about how valuable the night sky is for science, from early thinkers, discoverers, and navigators to the high value um, that we get from learning about asteroids that could be whizzing by the planet even today. Um, we're gonna learn about impacts to human health and how our light impacts plants and animals in the natural world as well. So a little bit about me, uh, for the past six years, I've worked for the Night Skies Division actually documenting um, these night skies um, throughout the basin and range. I take a camera like this one out and I climb mountaintops and on those mountaintops, I take images and those images tell me how much light is in the sky after the sun has set. I wait until the moon goes down so only natural light should be coming in um, and artificial light from humans. And this image was taken right outside of Las Vegas and you can see um, it's very bright. There's a very bright light dome along the horizon. As we move to a darker area right outside of Joshua Tree, you can see that's my little car in the corner, um, but you can see this picture along the horizon with um, the light dome of Southern California in view. And then you get to a darker area outside of Great Basin or with inside of Great Basin National Park. And you can see from horizon to horizon the Milky Way. Um, when you start to see skies like this, you can really understand um, how wasteful artificial light can rob us of such an important part of our planet, this view of the night sky. Uh, this is an image that one of our cooperative members um, uh, took in northern Nevada. It's really beautiful, um, this beautiful image of the night sky. And this is just here to remind us that we all have the responsibility to protect the night sky, reduce light pollution, and then we all reap the benefits of this really astounding beauty. With light pollution or the excessive waste of artificial light, we have really removed some of these natural cues that wildlife, um, especially nocturnal wildlife, rely on to properly function in their habitat. Um, and hopefully by the end of this night and by the end of watching this film, we can feel a little bit more connected with each other and ready to do what we can to protect night skies and reduce light pollution and put the stars back um, in the night sky throughout the basin and range dark sky cooperative and even in your own backyards. I wanted to share a few tips that we share with all the members in the basin and range dark sky cooperative that will help you reduce your lighting footprint. Um, remember that all lighting should be useful. Um, uh, these lights help um, navigate, help cars navigate a roadway. These lights can help um, people see stairs um, for wayfinding to prevent tripping hazards. If you can't identify why a light is there, um, then it might not be that useful. Or if it's a wasteful um, use of light, uh, like landscape lighting that points directly into the sky and can um, disturb uh, migrating birds or wildlife habitat. That's a wasteful use of light. Light should be targeted. So this light um, shines on um, this lodging on the door and on the stairwell. This light shines on a field. So these are um, lights that are shining where they're supposed to, not shining on mountaintops. Um, and outside of the, the sports field. Light should be low. We shouldn't have really, really bright light um, that's unnecessarily bright. We can use tools like demulators to reduce brightness. So this um, light is probably meant for this parking lot, yet it's shining on this road, this sidewalk, and this house. And this light here um, is supposed to be for this road, yet it's shining on this apartment building. And light should be controlled. Um, if a person's not there, the light doesn't need to be turned on. And in the film, they'll talk a little bit about um, high pressure sodium or HPS lights and LED lights. 
Um, and the warmer spectral content of high pressure sodium lights, um, that's, that's a preferable spectral content or a preferable color temperature for human eyes and it's better for wildlife too. Um, LED technology is adapting to, to um, increase the amount of warm light within um, their, their spectral capabilities. So now LED lights are around 2700K you can buy from the store, um, but warm lights are better than these cool white lights. Hopefully some of those tips will be useful to you while watching the film and thinking about lighting in your own homes and communities. Just wanted to thank everyone for joining us tonight. And if you get some time and want to learn more, we would love to have you like us on Facebook and Instagram and visit us at brdarkskies.org. I'm so thankful to Shri Ram for sharing this event and for Dawn that helped plan all of the logistics for tonight's program. Um, let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Um, is Sri Ram on the phone? If not, we might just start the film, Don. What do you think? Nope. Oh yeah, sorry, I'm muted. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, I just heard from him saying he was having problems with the Zoom link and so, I've just okay. sent him another. So, um, okay. so yeah, we'll just wait to hear from him afterward. Hopefully, that's organized. And let me get this together. Okay. Oops. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, I can't see with my bar. Wrong one. Apologies, I've got two up the, uh... okay. Here's the one I want, okay. Okay, is everyone seeing that full screen? Got it. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so if everybody would mute. We get people come up here to Chabot all the time wanting to see the Milky Way. Unfortunately, we can't show it to them because of the light pollution. So it, more and more it's getting to the point where the only way you can experience what the night sky really looks like is either A, go find yourself a really dark location high up in the mountains, far away from city lights, or come here to our planetarium. When you're inside the planetarium, you see the sky pretty much the way you would if you were up on that high mountain away from city lights. You know, people are amazed. They get to actually see the Milky Way, they get to see thousands of stars instead of maybe a few dozen stars. And they really experience what the night sky looked like a hundred years ago from here in the Bay Area. We live in a world that is woefully short of humble behavior. And I, I come here to be humbled. Every year, we come out here about this time of year when the when it's just starting to rise, right. and we all have the same uh, response like, oh, there's clouds coming in. <gasps> no, that's the Milky Way. Yeah. For being in the middle of the night, it's kind of it's kind of bright out here, and I started noticing I was casting a shadow as I was walking yeah. along. And, and then we look up and we realize it's because the Milky Way is so bright that yeah. it's casting a shadow. When I look up at a, a sky full of stars, and, and my, my favorite is to be in, in those those places where literally the instant your eyes lift above the horizon, the stars pop into existence. And so it's a, it's a full bowl, uh, a hemisphere above you, uh, just rich with stars that you feel like you could reach out and touch. You know, we always say that travel increases your worldview and your depth of thinking. And I guess we're kind of 
doing that in the maximum possible way because we're showing people things that are so mind-bogglingly far away. We're not only showing people distance, but we're showing people time. You're looking at the history of the Earth. You're looking at the history of our solar system, our galaxy, the universe as a whole, every single one yeah. of these stars. All of the light that you're seeing came from some time in the past. So we're looking at basically a giant time machine. And each one of these dots that you're seeing right now, it left that star potentially millions or even billions of years ago. For me, the charge is whether it's just looking back like we are right now or finding it in the telescope, understanding that those photons left so long ago only to strike my eye, that is an amazing feeling, an ama you know, especially when I've been looking for something, you know, and I look at the chart and it's 70 million light years away, it's like, holy cow, that was, those photons left 70 million years ago, and if we believe the science, that's back when the dinosaurs were around, and here it is finally striking my eye. When I am viewing the skies, and I'm looking at nebula, and I'm looking at stars, and I'm looking at galaxies, and I'm looking at star clusters, I'm actually traveling through space. And so for myself, it's a way to reconcile the fact that I will never physically be in space, but through the end of my telescope, I am in fact traveling through space. I mean, how many times tonight have we all gone like, oh wow, did you see that? Actually, how many of us put uh, new moon on our calendars for our family so they know? And oh, how many absolutely. Of us, how many of absolutely. us instruct family members now, don't schedule this Well, my period. my two daughters got married, and both of them asked me which, which, <laughs> which weekend in September could they not get married. <laughs> <laughs> it is like drug addiction because it's a very pleasurable experience that we organize our life around and that our mood changes with. That's right. So, so, and that we spend all our money on. Right, <laughs> right, it is a good analogy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and for me, it's it's great because I sunburn easily, so I've got to do something that's, that's, that's a, you know, so it works out great for me. Oh, baby girl. When you do get a chance to get out to a dark sky and you look up and you see that, that, that sky full of stars, we are living in a galaxy of over a hundred billion stars. There's over a hundred billion, perhaps a trillion other galaxies out there. And the number of other stars, the numbers of other places there could be life is staggering, and especially with the recent discoveries from the Kepler mission that potentially as many as half those stars you see in the sky at night Half of them could have planets. And even with pessimistic numbers, you are now starting to talk about perhaps millions, at least tens of thousands of other planets out there where there could be some form of life. And, and that, that for me is what, what blows my mind on a nightly basis. We are made of stardust. We are the descendants of ancient stars in the sense that some of the elements that were fused in the interiors of those stars were incorporated into our own bodies. We are the, the material of the cosmos. It's learned how to understand itself. Every single generation of human beings, up until really only 200 years ago, saw a star-filled sky every single night of the year. And that is what we have robbed people of today. The viewing in Silicon Valley or anywhere within an hour of it is just it's terrible. You, you can't see, other than a couple of the really bright objects, you're missing out on, well, <laughs> all of this. 80% <laughs> of North American and, and European populations no longer live someplace where they can even faintly see the Milky Way from their homes. It's hard enough under a perfect sky to try to figure out how we fit into it all. But at least we've got a reference, you know. Without the sky, oh, that's a huge loss. With a star-filled sky, our ancestors developed science. The science that we have today 
Harriet Tubman took so many slaves to freedom is because she could read the sky. She followed the drinking gourd, followed the North Star. We've made a sky in which nobody bothers to look anymore. So the North Star, that star that, that was a signal for those, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere, for a fixed point in the sky by which to navigate. Well, most people today don't even know where the North Star is. I've traveled to, to central Los Angeles where you can look up on a clear summer evening. I can count all 12 stars in the sky. And in fact, one of those is probably on its way to LAX. So 11, 11 stars. When you have only 11 stars in the sky, it very quickly sends the message. There's no point in looking up. What we know about our universe has no direct bearing when all you can see in the sky is a handful of stars. Dark places in the United States are becoming fewer and fewer. We live in the city and we're, we're used to it. I mean, it's a shame yeah, we, we can't, are used to it. It's a shame we can't see stars in the city. Even though, you know, I look up every night from my front porch, I look up like this and I would see four. I would look around, I'd see four stars or maybe five. This is depressing in the city. It's so depressing. What if there was nothing but fog every day? You could drive down the street, you could only see 50 feet in front of you. You could never see a vista. You'd, you'd cross the Rocky Mountains in a fog all the time. What would you lose? It's like it would be similar. We lose the connection. We lose the ability to understand that there are other worlds out there. We are not by ourselves. We are not the only star. We are not the only planet. And I believe we are not the only life in the cosmos. Imagine. You're out camping in the back country of your park, and you're, you're sleeping under the stars. And now imagine I took that sky away, and I replaced it with the sky that I see back in Los Angeles, an orange glow with just a few scattered pinpricks. Wouldn't you say you've lost something? Wouldn't you say that some aspect of your enjoyment, your presence in the natural world had disappeared? Our lights that shine upwards, that create light pollution, they're robbing us of the, the stars overhead. And so they're robbing us of this natural view of our universe at night. So imagine, imagine a child that never got to see a tree. Well, we're doing the same thing here by raising an entire generation, and in fact, creating future generations that may never see a star. And if you don't see a star, if you don't wonder about this universe overhead, and so create a, a world in which what you can see ends at our own atmosphere, then where is that next generation of science, science and scientists gonna come from? You grow up in a city and you've never experienced the night sky, and then you're told that you're living in light pollution, it's kind of like, say what? You know, what is, what is light pollution? What are you even talking about? The light pollution here in the Bay Area, especially for us here at Chabot, has gotten worse over the last several years. Here at Chabot Space and Science Center, we have a 36-inch reflecting telescope, Nelly, part of a global network of observatories that search for and track near-Earth asteroids. Asteroids and comets are still out there. We have the ability to detect them, but only if we can see them. In order for us to see these asteroids in our images, we have to have really dark skies. A small asteroid may be somewhere around magnitude 20, which means it's a million times fainter than the faintest star you can see with your naked eye in a really dark location. And as more and more light pollution develops, uh, becomes harder and harder to see those really faint asteroids. And that means we can't see the small ones even when they're close, and we can't see the big ones when they're farther away. And that, that's a problem, you know, if you're trying to find a, a large asteroid, not hours before it hits us, but years before it hits us, you want to be able to see it even when it's pretty far away. And as light pollution increases, it becomes harder and harder to do that. And this is getting worse, and it's been getting worse ever since they started installing these uh, new LED streetlights.
awareness of light pollution and the, and the problems that it's producing is, is the number one issue for helping solve it. The amount of energy that's wasted through senseless lighting is a contributor to our energy consumption and our carbon footprint. Uh, it's estimated here in the United States up to 40% of the lighting that we use is wasted. It's just money down the drain. Here in the United States, we use an awful lot of uh, light at, at night. Unfortunately, we've sort of grown up in a culture of very inexpensive uh, electricity. If you want to attract attention, you use light because it's natural at nighttime. If you see a light that's bright, you're going to look towards it. And so many retail outlets will take advantage of this. And you can notice, of course, with gas stations, that there's a progressive increase with the amount of light to attract interest. The lighting under a gas station canopy is advertisement. It's see me. And if a guy puts a gas station in the opposite corner, see me more. Some of these gas stations have higher light levels than the kinds of light you experience during the day. And how is that possible? I have measured <laughs> lighting in, in some service stations. It came out to 112 foot candles. When the ISNA recommended the luminance level at the pump is five foot candles. So over 20 times the recommended luminance level. Think about what happens when you're in that situation. What your eye does. Well, what it's supposed to do, it torques down the iris. Think about it. It's night and it's so bright, your, eye, your pupils have to constrict. That's, that's nuts. There's a difference, I think, between something that screams at you and says, we're, we're bright, as opposed to something that says, look, we are a safe environment and it's comfortable. If you would go to a gas station and say, look, if you use lower levels of light, it will cause less glare and will cause less melanopsin disruption. Please turn your lights down and do this. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to say, but the person across the street has got 10 times as much light. So that's why you need either education where everybody agrees that this is a good standard or a good way to do business. Otherwise, you know, it's a jungle. And unfortunately, the jungle prevails right now. And any satellite map of the world will tell you that this is true. The way one entity differentiates itself on a retail is to put more light in. And so you just have to take a walk through New York at, at night. And there's all these retail interests competing for people. It's almost like the, you know, the loudest music is going to be heard first, or the brightest light is going to be seen for, first. Is that a good thing? People are thinking, we need to provide a lot of light at night so people can see not really understanding that they may be producing conditions of glare and discomfort, which cause even more serious problems. Consider a scenario where a convenience store is, a crime takes place. Their response was, we need more light because then it'll be more safe. So they put a thousand watt metal halide lamp up there blasting on to the, to the area. Um, tell me, if they put up two, are they twice as safe? No. Okay, then let's say there's a crime that actually takes place. Have you ever been on stage? You know what it's like to be on stage and you have bright light shining in your face? What can you see? Nothing. So let's say you're the responding officer. You're the cops coming into this parking lot. What are you faced with? A thousand watts of metal halide glory blinding you and you can't see what's in front of you. Is that safe? No, that's not. Better lighting is safe, not more lighting. So in this particular case, if they had lights that were shining down and not in the face, that way you're switching the tactical advantage back to the responding officers instead of the perpetrator. You have installed criminal-friendly lighting by putting in poorly designed knee-jerk reaction, oh, brighter means safer. That's not the case. Think about what you're doing. And in most cases, subtle, subdued lighting is a much safer situation. Even better if it could be on a motion sensor, because that way the perpetrator would trip the light Everybody notices. If you look at most robberies or most crimes that are actually done during the day or done in well-lit areas, very famous astronomer um, was mad because they had lit the campus where he was and they shined lights on the observatory where he worked. And he complained about that. And various groups said, you're, you're for the criminals, you're terrible. Uh, we can't do anything about this. This is protecting us from crime. And so he went to the scene of every violent crime in, in this modest-sized city 
in Connecticut for two years and documented the lighting. And every one, most of the crimes, uh, robberies and assaults and murders were almost all during the day and the ones at night were all in the areas. I took these statistics and finally got the lights taken down and not shining and got better lights put in this campus. The city of Chicago decided to light all of their alleys really bright and that's where the crimes took place because criminals need a lot of light to see as well. So just throwing light at the problem is not the solution. We waste most of the light that we install in cities by having it shine straight up into the air. We human beings, we are not afraid of giant mutant creatures sweeping out of the dark sky to abduct us. So there is no reason we should be lighting up the sky. There's nothing up there that's bad for us to see. Rather, there is an entire sky full of stars that we would love to see. So put the light on the ground where we need it and we can get stars and be safe. Everything's being replaced by LEDs now. They're, they use substantially less amount of watts to achieve the same level of illuminance. The solid state technology offers opportunity for unprecedented levels of con control. And control is both uh, the intensity, the amount, the amount of light, the amount of light over time. So you may want to have more light in the early evening and less light late in the evening. The other interesting point is, is that you can make any color you want. The critical thing is that the LEDs uh, be a 3,000 Kelvin temperature or less. Those in 3,000 Kelvin have less short wavelength emission, call it less blue light. no perfect LED, there's always going to be some sort of uh, additional blue light, short wavelength emission, compared to the older high pressure sodium. Our human eye perceives the blue light much better and it appears bright. So like say in, in Tucson, we have switched over to 3000 Kelvin LEDs, but at the same time we dropped the illuminance level 60%. and. In so doing, nobody has noticed. It still looks about the same brightness as the previous technology did. And in addition, we dim the lights even further at 11 o'clock. So it's, it's down to 30% of what the output was with the older technology. When you do those things, you reduce the lumen output and you change the technology. There's actually less blue light going into our night sky now than there was with the previous high pressure sodium technology. City of Phoenix, they had originally specified 4,000 Kelvin products, and the word got out that, wait a minute, th we've, we've heard this is not good. And they went to the city council and said, let us see what you're actually doing. So they actually put up um, in various places around town the different lights that they were thinking about. And had people said, come take a look, what do you think? And unanimously was, we want the warmer product. In this case, it was 2,700 Kelvin. We actually installed different color temperature lights running at different amperages on one single street and invited the community to come out and take a look. The highest color temperature running at the highest wattage and amperage was the least preferred. The lamps that were running at the lowest color temperature and lower, lowest amperage were the most preferred. LEDs have both promise and peril. Okay, they're not all good. You can have some LED lamps that are, are very cold I mean, the, the Kelvin temperatures up in the four, five, even 6,000 degree range. They become piercingly blue, very harsh. If you don't understand what I'm saying, have you ever driven at night and you see some cars have those headlights? Everybody knows what I mean when I say those headlights. They're despised by oncoming traffic. You're looking at five, 6,000 Kelvin products because they needed that kind of temperature to get a reasonable efficacy. In the decades time, the technology has improved so fast that it's now possible to get 2,700, 3,000 Kelvin products that will have double the efficacy of what a 5,500 Kelvin product had 10 years ago. We're seeing a relatively rapid market transformation from HPS to LED. It's happening so quickly that I would characterize this as a rush. And in many cases, I would characterize it as an uninformed rush.
and we are doing many things with lighting that we should not be doing. And this is being the press for energy savings, the press to, to transform our mar market space into LED. So what we ended up today is that we have many municipalities that have put in lights that are very glary, have the wrong color temperature, are, um, are very disturbing. There are street lights that are so uncomfortable that you have to put your hand over your eyes. And it's atrocious that we have this in our environments, absolutely atrocious. So in this push, we moved very quickly from HPS, which was uh, predominantly a yellow spectrum with very little blue into it, to a whitish blue spectrum that had an enormous amount of blue in it. And they were cheap, pushed out very quickly. We saw a lot of cities rush, rush, rush to this, and they got the energy savings. But unfortunately, the blue end of the spectrum for these light sources also matches up pretty closely to the melanopsin sensitivity of your eye. And the melanopsin sensitivity controls the melatonin, and melatonin is a foundation hormone that, that impacts many other body processes, hormonal processes. Blue light at night is what's problematical for nocturnal habitat disruption, circadian disruption, and sky glow. There's enough scientific evidence out there now that is saying that, you know, light at night is probably not good for us. And it's more specifically the blue end of the spectrum. A gentleman in Anchorage, Alaska, described to me during his test installations, so it was like living under an arc welder. It was hated. It was just this piercing, high, blue, ouch light. He's completely curious to see them complaining of the blue light when the blue light is more natural for us because the blue light is the light of the day. So they see better, they have the feeling that they are more safe, more secure, but still they are not happy with this light. Our question of research was uh, to find a way to measure the impact of street light on uh, the quality of our sleep. The light in our street have a direct correlation with the amount of sleep that we were taking during the night. The light that we put on our head inside of the cities has a consequence during the day. You have an excessive sleepiness. People living near a big road with a big amount of light. These people were practically all sleeping after midnight. Also, if it was possible to close completely their windows with big curtains, still the effect was the same. So it was beginning probably in the evening. Blue is a problem, is our light of the day. And this is increasing our alertness. The secretion of melatonin will be delayed. Our biology on an evolutionary basis has never seen blue light at night, ever. There's lots of studies out there showing that it's harmful for birds and, and animals. It upsets nocturnal behavior. Insects are drawn towards lights and birds and bats follow them into the cities where they exhaust themselves flying around or into towers. Artificial light at night has not just an effect on certain species, but also on ecosystem functions. Artificial light at night keeps the pollinators away from visiting flowers and thereby reduces the pollination success of plants. We found out that artificial light at night reduces the number of visits to flower by about 60%. Dung beetles. Dung beetles use the Milky Way as a navigation point in the sky in order to roll their little balls of dung in a straight line away from other dung beetles that might want to steal it. The dung beetles use the night sky to navigate, sort of like a buffet of compass cues to guide them along their routes. A little insect, of course, has a very small brain, less than the size of a grain of rice. It's actually amazing that such a tiny brain can allow an insect to do such an amazing thing as navigate in a straight line. So. This idea that, that we humans alone use the sky above and that only we are going to be effective if it goes away is just wrong.
Artificial light at night is a major problem for birds, and it's especially a problem during migration. So migration happens in the northern hemisphere twice a year in the fall and in the spring. There are hundreds of millions of birds flying over New York City at night, and they're using the stars to navigate, they're using the, the moon to help them see things, they're using the, the Earth's magnetic field, they're hopping on the right winds, tailwinds to carry them in the right direction. And then they're flying along, and let's say they fly past New York City, and all of a sudden there's this big light. And birds are attracted to light. Birds do go fly to the light. And then we've seen in these very strong beams of light, like the cilometer used at an airport or a tribute in light memorial that we have here every year in New York City, birds will fly to that light beam and then they'll wind up flying around and around and around. They can't get out of it. We say they get caught in the light. Sometimes they get out on their own. <laughs> uh, sometimes we need to extinguish the light if we can. And the problem with the light, the light itself doesn't kill the birds. What the light does is it changes the bird's behavior. If you're changing behavior during migration, it's something the bird hadn't planned on. So it needed a little extra energy to carry it past that point. These are birds that are flying thousands and thousands of miles, sometimes without stopping, to get from one point to another. And they only have a certain amount of time to do it because their, their life, their offspring depend on it. And they don't have that extra energy that they carry to make a detour. And the energy that birds use is, for the most part, in the form of fat. But if you think about a person who's going on an airplane trip, you want to pack the most amount of stuff that you need in the smallest <laughs> suitcase so you don't have to carry as much. Well, it's the same thing with the birds. They want to pack on as much fat as they can without being so heavy that it costs them more to fly. So having a detour like this can have a dramatic effect on the bird's survival. What we see is birds landing in places where they didn't plan to land because they get confused and tired, exhausted. And then the next day, when the light comes up, the natural light, the birds will continue on their flight or go to sit in a tree and look for food. And what they'll do, especially in a city, is fly into glass. So either transparent or highly reflective glass. The bird thinks it's flying into a tree, but it's flying into the reflection of a tree. Or the sky, it's really flying into the reflection of the sky, and it's flying at a good clip. We find dead birds on the streets during migration. And these birds are in great condition, except that they have concussions or they have broken, broken skulls, internal injuries from hitting a wall. About one billion birds die every year in the United States just from collision. Florida is host to around 90% of all the sea turtle nesting that occurs in the United States. Not only does light confuse uh, adult sea turtles and typically cause them to nest in lower numbers on beaches that are highly lit, it also confuses hatchling sea turtles when they come out and emerge from a nest. The impacts of lighting show up in two different ways. One is that the adult females who are attempting to come to shore to nest are generally dissuaded from nesting where there is a lot of artificial light. You know, if you imagine this animal evolved over millions of years to return to a beach uh, at night to lay its eggs and a beach at night is supposed to be dark. In the modern era, turtles are returning to shore. You can imagine they're 100 meters offshore, looking at the place where they want to come up, and it's just lit up. There's all these artificial points of light. It is disorienting to them. They perceive it as a threat, and so they don't nest as much in areas where there's a lot of light. Sort of the converse is true for hatchling turtles. Here are newly emerging turtles that have never been outside of the nest, literally. They're going into the open air for the first time, and in order to survive, they must get to the water and then swim offshore and find the current and the habitat that they can survive in. And that initial instinct on how to get to the water is influenced by several things very strongly, one of which is the slope of the beach, 
they tend to understand that, that downward seems to be the direction to go in. But even more powerful is the light. On a dark sky, even with no moon or no stars, a cloudy dark sky at night, the direction of the water is still the brightest horizon. Hatchlings have developed this instinct to go in the direction of the brighter horizon. Obviously, if towards the land is the brighter horizon because of artificial light, it attracts them, and that's what we see. In Florida alone, every year, tens of thousands, maybe even 100,000 or more hatchlings are disoriented and go toward the land rather than toward the sea, and that's that. Here's an animal that's been around for uh, more than 100 million years and has survived through ice ages, through all kinds of environmental calamities and obstacles in the environment. And we come along and because we want our back patio lit up and light shine out onto the beach, we're actually causing the deaths of this ancient animal that predates the dinosaurs. Light pollution is the one form of pollution that's relatively easy to solve. The amazing thing about light pollution, unlike all the other work that I'd done previously with endangered species and migratory birds and wetlands restoration, it takes years and years, if not millennia, to restore those systems to back to some semblance of what they were before. Whereas with light pollution, you literally can flip a switch and make a difference immediately. U.S. national parks have become one of the best places to go to see a, a natural night sky. When the national parks did surveys asking visitors what did they find most special about visiting a national park, uh, a star-filled sky is right up there with uh, wildflowers, waterfalls, and wildlife. National parks are such a great place to come and view the night skies because there's so few places left that don't have the intrusion of light pollution. You have naturally dark places, you also have naturally wild places. So the soundscapes and the night skies are a way for us to conserve and preserve the wildness of a place. And that's important because there's so few wild places left. Night sky talks in national parks are the number one ranger program given across the country. My favorite part about doing night sky programs is seeing visitor reactions. When they realize that the Milky Way is a huge streak of stars in the sky and not a cloud, the reactions are off the wall. They just go nuts. We've got the handle here and the top of the teapot, and the Milky Way is the steam out of the teapot. <laughs> The Dark Sky Festival started in 2012. We've been doing astronomy programs in the park for a number of years before then. The festival started with just a handful of volunteers and a few telescopes, and now it's growing into a huge event where we've got multiple volunteers hosting thousands of visitors and over 40 different events throughout the weekend. We also have Junior Ranger astronomy programs where kids can come out, learn about the solar system, learn about some of the shooting stars and meteorites that they're gonna see later that night. Now, I need somebody who's got a really good sense of rhythm It can give me a beat. You guys see that? Okay, so I'm going to call it out. You guys are going to call it back to me, all right? Astronomer Boogaloo. We're astronomers, and we're here to say... We're astronomers, and we're here to say... We study the stars every day. We study the stars every day. Sometimes we use a Sometimes we use a satellite. Sometimes we use a scope. Sometimes we use a scope. One day we want to go to Mars. One day we want to go to Mars. 
It's dark up here. You might have noticed that when you're camping, if you have to get up in the night. Oh, it's dark, huh? We don't have street lights. We don't have malls. We don't have shopping centers and all that. We just have a lot of nature, don't we? And nature doesn't have a lot of lights. There's no lights in the trees, are there? <laughs> you want to say that with us, please, Are you ready? My dear mother just served us nectarines. Nice. Okay. Let's say that again. Ready? My very educated mother just served us nectarines. Woo! Don't show. Ten out of ten. Ready? Astronomy and dinosaurs, I mean, those are the two things that every kid seems to, to be fascinated by and wonder about and excited. It just, it fires the imagination. Watching a kid see Saturn through a telescope is one of the coolest experiences. It excites them so much. It is a gateway to all other sciences. But they really, they, they serve as a gateway to the sciences, a gateway to wonder about our universe. One of the great things about astronomy is that it's not a science, it's all science. Astronomy is physics. Astronomy is chemistry, mineralogy, geology, meteorology, even now it's biology. I'm really excited, you know, we've only been doing the Dark Sky Festival for a few years, but wouldn't it be great if uh, 20 years from now somebody who came to the Dark Sky Festival was inspired to become a scientist or engineer at NASA uh, because they had a chance to speak with, uh, with a NASA scientist while they were here and then look through a telescope. We're seeing a rapid increase in expansion. So we have fewer and fewer wild places left. So I hope we can build that next generation of stewards to realize the value of protecting wild places. Oh God, that was amazing. It was. The mission of the International Dark Sky yeah. Association is to create a world without light pollution. We spend a lot of time trying to educate uh, individuals, communities, as well as policymakers about the issue of light pollution and how they can be solved. IDA has 60 or 70 chapters around the world, and these are made up of people, individual citizens, who care very, very much about protecting the night sky. We've got a really great program called the International Dark Sky Places Program, and it's a certification program, and it's very rigorous, it's, it's evidence-based, it's scientifically grounded, that uh, identifies the okay. real dark sky landscapes uh, around the globe. The goal of the program is to recognize the efforts that people are undertaking in places all around the world to try to preserve what remains of natural darkness where it still exists. We have about 85 designated international dark sky places in the world. Policy can be very effective in trying to both preserve conditions as they are, but also to even roll them back. And there's an interaction between policy <coughs> and international dark sky places where we have some evidence that the efforts that are undertaken to protect the dark sky places have actually resulted in the sky getting darker. Tucson area is, is known for its world-class observatories. And as the ambient light pollution increased with the growth of Tucson, the astronomy community said, we've got a problem here that we need to fix. Our two co-founders, Tim Hunter and Dave Crawford, they developed one of the most progressive lighting ordinances that, that controls lighting uh, in Tucson. So it's a very dark, it's a very quiet city from a light pollution perspective. If you look at Kitt Peak, there have been studies over the years, the quality of the skies has not deteriorated in the last 20 years. It remains one of the darkest cities around the nation, and I think is a prime example of how light pollution can be managed without sacrificing safety. There are many beaches around Florida where there's high density sea turtle nesting, like the Archie Carr National Wildlife Refuge, Hobe Sound. It's extremely dark on the beach at night. I mean, there are homes and condominiums along that beach, but they're all using turtle-friendly lights or else they just have turned their lights off completely on the ocean side at night. 
So it's quite dark on the beach. There's no evidence of increased crime because of seashore friendly lighting. In fact, one of the things that people don't really understand until they experience it is that you can actually see better at night in seashore friendly lighting. All of our exterior lighting is dynamically controlled on a local basis where the lights will, will dim down considerably during periods of inactivity and when there's, when there's people or cars or, or bicycles that will ramp up. Our chief of police here, if they're doing tours around campus or around the city, if they see the lights turning on, they'll do a turn in. Or if they see the facade of a building at full light, they know that somebody's there or has been there and they'll take a look. And so now they actually talk about how this is contributing to, a, to the feeling of safety and security, and they're calling it their safer campus. We can get about a 70% energy savings just by putting in adaptive controls. We've heard from a number of property owners when we've converted most of their exterior lighting to CTOR friendly light, they've seen a 75% reduction in their utility bill. Most of the big cities right now are making the switch and are going with the warmer products. Chicago has specified 3,000 Kelvin. Tucson did. San Francisco has just made that declaration. We are upgrading 18,500 of our high-pressure sodium streetlights. We also took notice when the AMA issued their guidelines saying that cities and counties looking to upgrade their streetlights should choose LED lights that are 3,000 Kelvin temperature or below. And we're making sure that all that light is directed down. There's no light that's going up. We're lighting our streets, we're not lighting our skies. There are a lot of advantages to using LED lights and replacing our high pressure sodium street lights. LED lights in general produce a more uniform light distribution. The LED lights last longer, up to 20 years. The high pressure sodiums last three to five years. So you're gonna save on maintenance costs. The LED lights use up to 50% less energy per light. At our cost of service, we're projecting that we will save close to a million dollars per year on electricity costs alone. In some ways, it's easier to save the stars than other forms of pollution. You think about it, lots of forms of pollution, like cleaning up a river or taking the carbon dioxide out of the air, is really tough. But light pollution is real simple to solve. Don't put lights in where you don't need it. Put the right amount in the ground, shield it so it goes to the ground, and turn it off when it's not needed. Light where you need it, when you need it, in the amount necessary and no more. Why pay for something you're getting no benefit out of? A good design would not shine light up. No light should shine above the product itself. Try to implement some type of control system. We have a program here at the International Dark Sky Association called the Fixture Seal of Approval that provides individuals who are looking for ways to make a difference at their home or in their community. A wide variety of products which can be found on our website. There are three different features that we can adjust to make the light less disoriented. One is to bring it closer to the ground. If we lower that light physically, then less of it reaches the beach itself. The other is to keep it shielded so that it's really focused on only those areas where we need it. There's no reason to light up the whole sky or have light shine out onto the beach. Sort of more on a technological basis, longer wavelengths of light tend to disorient turtles less. Every one of the places where we have retrofitted lights and there was disorientation before, there has been no disorientation after. We have grant money to pay for the fixtures and the bulbs for lighting retrofits. You'd be surprised that sometimes we also get declined. The number one response when you start talking to property owners is, oh well, how am I gonna be able to see? They have a safety concern. They have a fear of losing light. Is it going to make my property more vulnerable to crime? Those are natural responses, especially natural when people have never encountered sea turtle friendly lighting. In many cases they hear, oh, you know, turtle friendly lighting means it's going to be dark. And that's not the case. It's just you have to experience what the light is going to be like. It's of the same spectrum that was the lighting for the Golden Gate Bridge for decades. For New York City Audubon's Lights Out program, we ask buildings to turn their lights out after midnight. It hasn't been a tremendous success because we only have about 100 buildings in the entire city of New York 
that sign on to turn their lights out for birds. It's interesting, you'd think that people would want to turn their lights out. It's like a no-brainer, right? Turn the lights out, save money. Why are the lights on anyhow? There's no one in the building. But there is pushback, and you get pushback by all kinds of reasons or explanations, like, well, we don't know who turns the lights out, or our cleaning people need the lights on, or it's a safety issue to keep lights on at night. All those issues I can acknowledge and they can all be worked around. Cleaning people need the lights on when they're cleaning and they can turn the lights out when they leave the room. Or for safety is to have a motion sensor light so when people are moving around then the light lights up. Um, and that's going to make a signal to people that there's someone moving around where they're really not supposed to be. It's part of the city to me to not have the night sky. It's always surprising to me if I could see something at all. So to me, it's not like I'm disappointed that the city doesn't have the night sky. What I am concerned about is that the cities will overwhelm the parts of the world that can see the night sky. Light knows no boundaries. It travels forever. Spreading the word to those bigger cities, while they might be really far away, the impact that they have on the natural darkness here at Lassen is, is pretty significant. So we hope that folks visiting from uh, San Francisco and Reno and Sacramento will go back and realize that the little things that they can do to reduce the light impact in those big towns actually will make a difference here at Lassen. People who are unfamiliar with our organization and they hear dark sky and they're going to we want to turn off all the lights. No. That's not the case. Our name says dark sky. It doesn't say dark ground. You can have both. There's no reason why you can't have excellent lighting and still see the stars. I live in Tucson, a municipality of over a million people. And I live seven miles from the city center. And I can see the Milky Way from my driveway every night. There's no reason why that can't be the case everywhere. Looking for asteroids, that's planetary defense. That's trying to protect the human race from potential impacts. And we know that those impacts have happened in the past. We know that the dinosaurs were wiped out by the asteroids. So, you know, there's some practical importance to it uh, as well. But the other thing is, it's just the basic desire to know. You look out there among the stars, you see what's out there, you want to understand it. You want to know how did it get there? You know, are we alone? By eliminating light pollution, by reducing that, we give the birds a better chance to see the stars. And the stars is what they're using to navigate with. We humans are smart enough to figure out how we're impacting the rest of the planet and other forms of wildlife and take relatively modest actions to give these animals a chance to survive. So if you do these simple things of shielding, lower wattage, lower uh, power LEDs, and an oranger, yellower LEDs, we can get the stars, we can be safe, we can save electricity, we can save natural resources. We can do all of this, and we get that sky full of stars. It's a win-win, win-win situation. We can all benefit from this and live in an industrial technological world perfectly safe and see the Milky Way once again, the way everyone used to. The majority of LED products that are being used in, this, in the changeout are dark sky friendly design. So it, it, this change in technology will actually accelerate the improvement. Shielding a light has an immediate effect. You don't have to wait for the environment to respond to it because it will begin responding immediately. And the number of times that I've had interactions with people in my line of work or explain this to them, or I give them a demonstration and I show them how uh, easy the solution is, the response that I get more often than not is people say, I had no idea. I didn't realize. It's awareness. At the end of the day, what we're trying to do is, again, to change this human notion about what light at night is and what it can do. And we start by building awareness that there's a problem under the belief that when enough people realize that it's a problem, they will then demand a solution. And I foresee that, that that time is coming and it is probably going to happen sooner than we think.
what do you like about looking at the night skies or being under uh, seeing so many stars uh, it makes me feel peaceful because it, we have like a really big world and the universe is so vast and when you look at the night sky you can kind of get lost feels really magical because everyone's doing it together. Yeah. For different galaxies? Yep. In different and galaxies for different solar systems? Yeah, yeah, some of them don't even exist anymore. It's just the light trying to get to us. <laughs> You're absolutely right. What's your favorite planet? Mars. My favorite planet is Neptune. Neptune? My, fa my favorite is Mars. Why? Because my favorite color is red, and I kind of like the explosive dust that's on Mars. Like in New York, they probably wouldn't be able to see the stars because everyone always has lights on. There's big posters with lights around them, and there's street lights. So. All right. All right. Well, we can all unmute and a big applause for Sharif. Um, thank you all. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to join before the, the screening. I had some technical issues. So apologies for that. Yes. Yes, well, you're here now. So um, before we get started on any kind of questions, I just wanted to hear from some folks. You know, I've been in advocacy for over 10 years and I have the same response. When you, when you talk about light pollution and people's responses, I just didn't know. And I just wondered, and you can unmute yourself and, and, and tell us like, is this new? Did you know? And now that you know, how might things change for you? And anybody's welcome to answer that. Okay, no one? So Ashley, have you uh, followed the chat? Any questions there that you see? Yeah, so there are, oh, where did my chat go? There are a few um, a few comments and a few questions uh, in the chat and some other messages that I've gotten. Um, uh, Nicole says it's an amazing documentary, Shriam, and she wants to share with everyone she knows. Um, Gabriella says, can you please come to Australia and make uh, the same film for there? Um, one of the questions that we've gotten is, uh, so it's been a few years since you've made this film. And if you were going to make this film again, what would you include and what would you exclude? So I would add more personal experiences. So I would follow say national park rangers on people who actually go up and measure the light pollution in, in national parks. and how that has been changing. So I would include that and also include more personal, like I said, more personal stories. I, I, and at some parts, I, I'm pretty new to filmmaking as in before this film, I had no idea how to make a film. I have a separate full-time job. So I've gotten a little better at editing. Uh, so would do better uh, editing. But in terms of removing anything, I don't think I would remove much content. I'd probably add more content. I know, Shuram, I would love for it to work out and for us to go out together and you could um, get some night sky photography photos of me in the field or some other National Park Service employee. Um, hopefully one day we can make that happen. Yeah, <laughs> the age I, of COVID is not making it easier for any of us, but. It, when, I, when I said this, I exactly had you in mind, like going up last and, and sharing that year, how you got inspired, uh, how you got interested in astronomy and all that and why you do your job. Um, so hopefully next time. Well, I'm still slated to go to Lassen. The last time I went, um, 
uh, up Lassen Peak. I, the last time I was in Lassen, I went up Lassen Peak three times, three in a week, trying to get uh, the image just right. But there were fires suppressing the light dome, so I, I didn't get it. So I need to go back to Lassen some point in the summer. So, um, okay. Um, Please keep. I, oh. Yes, go ahead, can, Stephen. Yes, uh, just want to chime in. I, I loved seeing the uh, programming up there at Lassen National Park. I didn't work there, but I did work for 16 years just up the road at MacArthur Bernie Falls State Park. Oh. And I started uh, astronomy programs there in 1988 and carried it through until I moved on. And I'm still participating now with the National Park Service uh, each summer in International Dark Sky Parks that I've been working at. So this is actually uh, a kind of a long uh, term uh, issue and uh, discussion point. Uh, we've been, the places I've been, we've been doing dark sky interpretation now for quite a while. And um, I would just like to see it uh, to kind of like reach the greater audience. I'm not sure that it is. At least the results don't look good. I now have a bright street light shining right into my front yard uh, that uh, the, the city has said that they have made improvements, but actually the improvement they made, they may have uh, used a better uh, uh, light control system, but they've got that LED brightness and uh, it just negates uh, any any improvement. Actually, it's worse. For me, it is. My little story. Yeah. Well, you know, doing sidewalk astronomy in cities is is something that we've tried to do. And and when Shiram came to town, what we did, we had the 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 film screening was at a uh, a theater that's called the Hollywood District because it's a 1930s building that's covered with the light bulbs and the whole area is to look like Hollywood and everybody, the, the, the design code is neon lights. And I asked for them to be turned off and brought telescopes across the street. So when people left the movie and they left the Q and A, they came across the street and got to see even in that very bright street, but without the movie lights, some objects that they've never had seen before. Some had never looked through a telescope and it really reinforced what we're missing because of light pollution. So it's great to have stuff in the national parks, but if we did more of that in the cities, we might get the message out. I agree. One of my favorite things that um, was featured in the movie was the ranger who mentioned um, what we do in Reno and um, the Bay Area and uh, Sacramento, especially around Lassen, um, what we do in those places impacts what happens in a national park. So I, uh, in the beginning, before you joined, I showed some images of a few cities um, that you could see from national parks and how uh, the light from those cities are actually um, traveling and affecting the light dome and your ability to see the Milky Way in those places. So. The things that we're doing um, all throughout the, you know, in our community, cities, and homes are impacting dark night skies everywhere, even in places that we think are really dark. So, uh, recently, so I'm currently in India on vacation. Uh, so, with my family, I had been to a semi resort type place, which is set up inside a, a remote uh, forest. And they had, I, I had seen the light pollution map and I knew the sky would be pretty dark there. But then they had these light domes uh, glaring up the, the sky and we could hardly see any stars. So after about 10 p.m. I asked them to turn off all the lights, they obliged. And they'd never seen so many stars, people even living there because they had these lights all going up. And then I told them, okay, you have these dark, stay friendly lights and uh, buy it here and then install these lights. They're pretty receptive, but it was, it's very, surprising that even people living in such dark places have no idea for the relations between the stars and uh, the night skies and, and light. So it is important to, some people would listen, some of them wouldn't, but it's important to keep raising this awareness about how light affects the night skies.
So um, somebody suggested um, a link to the film to um, be incorporated into educational materials. And I put the link early on at the very beginning. So if you look at the beginning of the chat, there is the YouTube link. And uh, you know, all of you are invited to share that with as many people you know, to share it with city councils, county commissioners, you know, any elected officials, uh, folks in the uh, departments of transportation, you know, who are responsible for street lights and highway lights, um, and to get the message out and to share it with the, you know, if you have any affiliation or you have kids in high school or college, um, to get it there. But, uh, you know, that one hour makes a difference <laughs> seeing the film. Uh, I, like I said, I was blown away when I saw it. I thought everything was covered in such an elegant uh, manner um, that it's just up to everybody to, to see it and share. So and a, uh, great, a great tool for remote le learning right now too. Exactly. So you all are invited to do this. I don't know how often we can get Sharam to, <laughs> to come and attend. Um, it's uh, early morning breakfast time for him. I wanted to ask, um, astrophotography and videography are really growing rapidly. I mean, they're one of like the, the biggest uh, draws to uh, Rosary astronomers is learning more about that. And I'd ask you, what advice would you give to practitioners about how they too might use their work in dark sky advocacy? So the, the question is about how people can get uh, to do more of astrophotography or how they can use that astrophotography. Well, to... you've used you've used all these astro images and you've used film to get the word out. And there's so mm -hmm. many other people who are doing this kind of, you know, videography and astrophotography. So how might you suggest they carry that on for advocacy? Right, so one, the, the one issue that a lot of astronomers and, and amateur astronomers have is uh, they tend to share their passion within their own group. They don't tend to tell the story outside their own group. You see uh, people are very, these are very closely knit community. And even when they speak to people outside, for example, when say there's a lot of activity going on in the sun right now, and people talk about sunspots in terms of the numbers, but to common people, those numbers don't mean anything. Mm -hmm. So you have to get astronomy out to these people in a way that they can relate. And you have to express how you feel under these night skies rather than saying the names of nebula or the names of galaxies or how, how far they are because these people are not able to understand. If you try to tell someone that the Andromeda galaxy is 2.5 million light years away, that doesn't mean anything to them. So you gotta try to come up with how far things are on earth, how far countries are on earth, and then how light goes around the earth uh, six or seven times uh, uh, a second and then eight minutes to the sun, and you try to build it up that way, and then finally say that in the universe, Andromeda galaxy is right next to us. So then it gives them some perspective. So you gotta take it to them in a way that they can understand. And when people post images, oftentimes I see amateur astronomers posting about the uh, technical specifications of it, what telescope and what, what lenses they use and everything. But rather it'd be nice if they can post how it made them feel looking at that, that small smudge, which is several million light years away and could have billions of stars. So if you get to people that way, then that is what we, that's what excites people. So you gotta talk to them in a way that they would be able to understand. Yeah, agreed. I've, I've noticed that, uh, you know, when we have star parties, uh, folks are pretty anxious to share what's inside their telescope. And I've created a little cheat sheet um, to ask people who are sharing their telescopes to relate it to light pollution and dark sky preservation by saying, do you know you could use your naked eye to split those two stars in the, in the Big Dipper, but for light pollution, you know, or do you know that with your naked eye, you could see Andromeda galaxy two and a half million light years away, but for light pollution and just those little links kind of can make the difference too. So you're, you're, you're spot on about the astro community. But it was the astronomy community that started the whole <laughs> IDA and, and the movement. And, and now we have others to join. Is anybody on the call um, 
active in any way in dark sky advocacy from, um, you know, or where do your interests lie? Astronomy, ecology, your own health, uh, neighbor trespass. Would anybody like to, um, to share? As far as I'm concerned, I, I mean, I've already spoken to that, but I'll just reiterate that that uh, is one of my biggest passions right now is uh, trying to um, encourage and help preserve uh, dark skies. I don't know how to do it in Bend, Oregon, but, um, uh, but uh, the movement is uh, with, uh, certainly with our national parks and the programs uh, thereof, uh, is alive and very well. And uh, that, just like the movie said, that's been my experience since 1988. Um, the astronomy programs are far and away the most popular events that we offer. Yeah. Hi, this is Erica. Can you hear Hi. me? Yes, fine. Hi, I'm an unofficial advocate, I guess. I um, am very passionate about this. And I'm friends with Rose, who is at the Malheur Field Station. Oh, mm -hmm. And I, I brought this up to her a couple years ago. I said, you know, you should try to get this designated as dark sky um, because it's still very pristine here. And, um, you know, ornithologists like to come here. Scientists like to come here. And it's a really wonderful common ground for people to share, um, you know, from all different fields of interest. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure where Rose is on it now. I know she started the process, um, but I, you know, I'd love to help in any way I can so that Oregon can yeah. have some official dark skies. We need some official dark skies in Oregon. Yeah, we've, yeah. Um, there is a sky quality, a permanent sky quality monitor that was set up at the Malheur Field Station. So, um, and, Travel Oregon is purchasing four uh, meters and uh, I'm going to be going to RCA board for, for some more to, to get them around the Oregon Outback um, to help support that effort because one of the things you need, even though it doesn't take much to prove that you've got, you know, <laughs> portal class one and two skies there, but you still have to get at least a year of data, seasonal data. Um, so that's, that process is beginning to have that data and uh, the Oregon Dark Sky Network has created a, a network to, uh, to share information and to engage the, 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 the local grassroots effort there to um, look to, to, to uh, nominate more than one or one large uh, dark sky place. That's exciting. Awesome. So anybody else have any questions for Sharam or? or for the, or, you know, or just to share? I have, I have one other one. I saw that there's over 12,000 hits on YouTube. And I know I've been involved in um, doing live screenings, you know, at the uh, theaters and, um, you know, when, I, when it wasn't on YouTube. And I'm wondering, you know, how many, how many film screenings that you know of have occurred like, you know, at a theater or at a council? Uh, at, at one point, I stopped counting. Uh, <laughs> in about, eight, I would say in about 30 or 40 different countries. Most of the screenings were uh, in the US, um, at almost 20 or 30 different national parks in the US, and a lot of screenings in Europe as well which is pretty uh, surprising where the problem is most prevalent and a couple of screenings in, in Asia, Singapore, India, um, Australia. I've actually moved to Singapore uh, about about a year, year and a half ago. So uh, uh, someone asked a question if I could make a similar movie in Australia. Uh, I've never been to Australia and really looking forward to, to go to Australia and shoot the night skies. The, mm soon, very soon when the borders open. But we have subtitles and someone actually volunteered to do the subtitles uh, in English. Uh, so we have subtitles in English, Turkish, Hindi, Spanish, uh, and a couple of other languages. So the kind of reach that this film has made, uh, I couldn't, I could never believe it. So it's mostly the kind of storytelling that I had uh, prior to that I had no experience for filmmaking. So it's just expressing my expressing my passion towards the night skies and 
and if more people start doing that and come together as a community pretty soon we'll, we should be able to see some change that's thrilling to hear how how broad it's been because you know i was trying to track and trying to share it with others and saying if you're going to share this please let me know so i can tell the film director too he can collect it you know i'm sure he likes to collect it you know what the the span is but that's great to hear that there's been so much that you've uh, stopped counting so and i did see mm -hmm. that it was closed captioning um I, although it didn't show up on screen and i apologize for that because uh I showed it with the MP4 that I had to get the best stable viewing, but the YouTube video, when you want to watch it again or share, is closed captioned. And yeah, if there are volunteers to 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 uh, put subtitles in different language, that would be awesome. But yeah. like, I want to share the, the some of the best feedback that I got for the for the film so it was playing at a film festival in uh, in a small town in ohio and after the film i got an email from someone who watched the film saying that uh, that her daughter uh, 12 year old daughter who is not so interested in science watched the film and I, and got inspired to to learn science and astronomy and yeah. to hear such such feedback is is priceless and the other day when i heard about how it influenced uh, portland's uh, city council to, mm -hmm. to, to come up or to approve the dark sky initiative. It, to hear feedback like this is, is very welcoming and it's inspiring me to make more such movies. Yeah, well, it, you, you've got me. I, my, my, my goal has been as a delegate to have at least five screenings a year and then COVID hit. So I, I'm hoping to be able to just do more like this or you know have other people um, continue to do it because it's a powerful film and I hope those of you um, who are still with us kind of will will share it and um, share the power of it and yes we will be putting it on um, there's several organizations that are members of the the Basin and Range Dark Sky Cooperative and we'll be sharing the the link on you know all the social media sites uh, the YouTube link and, and then this too is being recorded and will be on the YouTube channel for the Basin and Range Dark Sky Cooperative for folks to continue to share. Um, so, you know, pay it forward. Like the idea that he says this is his first film or at least feature length film is just amazing given the quality of it. So a big shout again. Thank Anybody you. else, do we have any other questions or anything that people wanna share? You see anything there in the chat? Uh, yeah, Gabriella, did you want to share anything about some of your work? You don't have to on the okay. chat. Um, oh. oh, no, that's okay. Hi. Um, the very excited yes, please was to um, make a movie over here. Um, mm -hmm. I realized when I typed it, it's a little bit the wrong stage. Uh, I'm just, I've just started a PhD in Tasmania, Australia, and I'm looking at how um, lighting and light pollution can influence human well-being through a variety of different um, mechanisms, such as well, considering safety and the impact of astrotourism on people's perception, as well as Indigenous astronomy and how that all relates. So I'm very new to the space, but it's amazing learning about what's going on all over the world. So it's lovely to be here. Thanks for sharing. How can we follow you, Gabriella? How, do, how can we follow your research? Um, I've just started a Twitter at the moment. I haven't, um, I haven't published anything, um, at this stage. Of the, um, can you put your Twitter in the chat so we can sure, follow you? Um, I'll put that there right now. That would be lovely. Um, stay tuned for when exciting things happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, for everyone, it's, it's really exciting that, uh, the amount of research that's being done in universities right now, so many people are working on their thesis statements that have something to do with light pollution. Um, just about every kind of uh, family genus order of species is affected. Uh, street trees, everything is affected. Uh, bees, you name it, it's affected. It's just, it's just not natural for the, the world that we evolved in for the past you know, four and a half billion years. So, um, there's more and more research. It's just about getting the information out to folks. So it's things like this and people sharing the link when it's posted on Facebook to share it with others or 
um, you know, put out a group uh, email to friends and, and do your advocacy part for um, the day and save the night skies too for the next generation. They say that the, the people who are most active as volunteers are people like my age because we can remember when it was dark and we don't want to see younger people miss out on that. And uh, it is kind of sad, the, the notion that there are people who, who are under 40 even, who, who don't even think to look up because they don't expect to see anything. So everybody, so, every person can make a difference to stop that from happening. Uh, I really agree with it. The first time I saw, it was about 10 years ago in Yosemite National Park in uh, California, and I stepped out of the cabin, I was saying that, and I saw a sky full of stars for the first time. It actually felt so unreal. It seemed it almost fake to me. How, how is this possible? I've never seen anything like this. Then I started photographing the night skies, and I would show it to my friends and family and colleagues. Most people said, how could there be so many stars? These stars don't exist. And it's a really bothering feeling that until people see it for themselves, they don't believe it because they cannot relate to it. And the, before making this, this feature documentary, I'd made a short film showing how the light, uh, night skies look like at different levels of light pollution, say starting from San Francisco, then ending in the middle of nowhere in Death Valley, showing what the night skies look like at different bottle levels. And the, that turned out to be the first visual representation of uh, what light uh, uh, pollution is and that is to common people it might be difficult to to get them to watch the 55 minute documentary but that really quickly captures it's called lost in light it really quickly captures what light pollution is and gets people interested and 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 speaking of uh if you look on youtube folks look for that lost uh uh, lost in light. Uh, there's two parts of it, and it really gives a great example of just the different kinds of brightness in the sky from light pollution uh, moving through what's called the Bortle classes. And I've shared that with lots and lots of folks because uh, you know it's that two to three minute, real easy thing to share on your on your on your social medias. And um, wanted to ask, do you have an, a future project? I, so after making this uh, film about the expression of passion for astronomy, uh, I realized I, I really like making films. I really like telling the stories. So recently, I've always wanted to live closer to family. So I moved to Singapore about a year ago. I'm actually working with uh, the local government in Singapore to, to make a movie to raise awareness on astronomy because if you know, Singapore is the most light polluted Mm -hmm. country and the city in the world and there's hardly any awareness so i recently got a telescope in singapore and i plan to take it out to do sidewalk astronomy and make a uh, film uh, on that and there has also been interest from malaysia and a couple of other countries in in southeast asia so it's it's starting to become a a bigger project but then i also have a couple of ideas not really directly related to astronomy coming up uh, uh, in the future Great, great. Look forward to it. Look forward it's to so it. great to see the community growing. And thank you so much, Sri Ram, for making the community grow even more. Um, it's mm -hmm. films like these that, you know, inspire people. So uh, thanks for letting us show it in the Basin Range. And thanks to everyone who joined us today, too. We really appreciate thank this you. community. Okay. If there's no other questions, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wrap this up for our 30-minute Q&A. So... Any, anything for the good of the order? No? Okay, well, dark skies, everyone. <laughs> Happy winter Thank you, nice. Thank you so much, Jerome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Yeah, well, there's a couple of us just left. Yeah. Um, so um, I've been around, I live in Bend, Oregon. I've been around this area just uh, uh, too often on -ish to really get my teeth into any uh, activity here. I'm active to some degree with the Sisters Astronomy Club. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, 
And then, uh, of course, there's the Oregon Observatory down in Sun River, which uh, does really, really good work. Um, but um, I got an email about this, and so I registered for it. But I'm not personally familiar with the, what is it, the, uh, the Basin and Range uh, Cooperative. Could you explain that to me? Yeah, um, I can, I'll take this one, Don. Mm -hmm. uh, the Basin and Range Dark Sky Cooperative. Uh, actually, Don and I met, um, was it uh, almost a year? It was a year ago in November. Um, I had just started the Basin and Range Dark Sky Cooperative and she had started an initiative in Oregon, the Oregon Outback. Um, and the Oregon Outback is a, a smaller version, more localized version of the Basin and Range. Dark Sky Cooperative. And this was modeled after the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative. And it basically is just, um, so are you, you're familiar with Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative, Stephen? Very much so. Yeah, okay. I worked at Natural Bridges National Monument the last few summers. Yeah, so um, I've been uh, working to build this cooperative for a little over a year now. Um, and so we have um, nonprofit partners, um, the IDA participates. We have bi-monthly meetings where people, um, where I, you know, I share updates from the group and everybody kind of works individually and um, shares each other as a resource. And it's a community of folks who can work with each other, help each other, um, get things uh, over hurdles, um, getting uh, parks, night sky certified getting areas night sky certified getting uh one of the things that we want to work on is getting a highway designated in nevada as a dark sky highway it'll be a dark sky route and which um, one uh oh <laughs> you um I'm i've so been on maternity leave for three months oh. so <laughs> i am out of the loop um it's not it's not the the loneliest highway i forget the number oh okay i mean I'm very what's that i think it's 89 i th that's okay. it's some highway 80 something um mm -hmm. but uh anyway there's a number of initiatives that we're working on in the base of range to promote night skies while we have them we have them here it's so nice it's a yeah largest where you, area. Where are you based out of, Ashley? I'm in Boulder City, Nevada. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh -huh. I'm in the Mojave. Right, 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 right. Okay, cool. Well, I worked uh, um, eight summers uh, in a row at uh, Great Basin National Park also, so. I think we might have met. You mm -hmm. look familiar. Uh, the first time I was in uh, Great Basin was about five years ago were you there i was there and then Absolutely. you went to the islands an island no that uh now i know somebody uh who uh, did go to ike sky uh, that would have been jeremy buck i think okay okay uh, yeah and then he worked with me at natural bridges this last summer okay. but uh, but uh, yeah, I was at Great Basin five, uh, well, basically uh, 2010 uh, through 2017. Um, and yeah, so some... Annie, I used to work with Annie Gillian. No, and... I, I Facebooked and... with her today. So yes. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, there's where room for, for more advocates, Stephen. So, you know, um, especially if you're in Oregon, if, if I've, sure. got your, I've got your information. Um, okay. Yeah, and uh, we could be in touch and see what we can do here. Uh, I'd be for that. Yes. Yeah, great. And if you're interested, I can send you um, an invitation, and you can join a Basin and Range Dark Sky Cooperative call and learn how learn about the community and connect with the community and see if um, how your work might fit in and yeah. at least meet some folks who are working on these efforts. I'd be highly interested in that, yeah, indeed. Yeah, I I still have some uh, deep roots in Nevada. My son lives there, so. Uh, well, we're in Oregon, Nevada. We're everywhere. I just I'm yeah. in Nevada, so and Don's in Oregon. So. Okay, great. Okay. great. Right. And Don, where are you? Uh, you. Uh, I'm I'm in Portland, Oregon. Portland. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, great, well, everyone. Thanks for staying on for me. Okay. Yeah, no problem. It's great to okay. have you. All right. All right. Bye, all. Okay. Bye now. Do you want to talk about anything, Don? I feel mm -hmm. like it went well. Nope. I'm going to, I should, before I leave the meeting, I should uh, stop recording. Stop.